Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ for this podcast for Lent 4, Series A on the wonderful text from John chapter 9. As you may remember from last week, I introduced these three weeks in Lent, John 4, John 9, and John 11, these three long readings from John's Gospel as being some of the most ancient texts in the liturgy, that they go back to the early church where they were used as the scrutinies to scrutinize those who were preparing for baptism to see if evil had entered their lives in some way, how Satan had worked in their lives, and especially to uncover any shame that they might have that would cause them to feel unworthy to come into the presence of God, first at the font and then, of course, uh, at the table. And so let's, let's look at these again very briefly and see how, how we're progressing in terms of these three weeks. The challenges I mentioned last week on each text is that they are so long. And that way you can see that we have really stories in front of us. And the, the key to, I think, preaching on these three texts is to have a sense of how they work together and how they build in preparing somebody who is being scrutinized for the waters of holy baptism, which was, as you know, the original purpose of Lent as a pre-baptismal season instead of a, a simply a penitential season. So if we, we think about it here, we started last week with John chapter 4, where we saw the themes of Jesus as living water and also that worship, true worship, is in spirit and truth. And we spoke about how that has to be worship that is centered in Christ. Now, even though this text does not occur in this sequence, I want to mention it, that in chapter 6, the famous bread of life chapter, where we see Jesus speaking of himself as the bread of life. And, and so, at least in John's gospel, you're moving from water, and we talked about the baptismal overtones here in John 4. And certainly, even though it is controversial, you can't deny that, especially when you're looking at it from the point of view after the, uh, the death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus, and people are celebrating the Lord's Supper and looking back at the words of John 6, you can't help but see that there are Eucharistic overtones. Now, today we're going to look at John 9, and here you can see that the theme has shifted a little bit. Jesus is going to speak of himself now as the light of the world. And then in John 11, this is next week, of course, Jesus is going to say, having said, I am the light of the world, here he's going to say, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, think about the progression here. We start really by seeing this very sinful woman who has a very complicated sinful life with all these husbands. I mean, you just, you just can see how she is, is looking for some sort of relief. And Jesus is that water that washes her and that shows her the, what true worship is. Um, what we're going to see today is that, that great text of the man born blind and how Jesus opens the eyes. And we're going to see here in John chapter 9 a number of significant themes. <clears throat> the open eyes, I'm going to show you how that is a refrain all the way through, that he has opened the eyes. But the open eyes comes by really very sort of overt baptismal acts. One is the anointing of the eyes with mud and how important mud is and the language of anointing, which is, of course, baptismal language. And then the washing, how he has to wash, and then his eyes are opened. Um, a very important, you know, tie to last week where Jesus is the living water. And then I mentioned this last week, how titles are so important. And here, I, I put the titles in blue. You can see one of the first ones here is rabbi, you know. 
And um, down below here, you can see just barely showing here that he is the I am the light of the world. So you have the, the, the title I am. But the titles in this particular pericope are Rabbi I am. He is going to be like he was in the last text described as the prophet. There is also, and it's sort of climactic, that he is the Christ. That's always an important one. And we end with Jesus questioning of him, of the man born blind, and, and describing himself as the son of man. And then finally, he is called the Lord. And I, and I want to, I wanna, you know, highlight those, those titles and, and this might be a, kind of a way to preach on the whole text. You can go through and, and, and look at each of these titles and explain how these titles are gradually helping everybody to understand that Jesus is, in fact, the one who has come to be the light of the world. <clears throat> Another set of themes here that <clears throat> you might want to see as a, a possible way of going at this, and this comes at the end, is the language of faith. And this is going to be, of course, in connection with the Son of Man. Now, faith might be a, a jumping off point, and you might want to end your sermon with this, because faith is going to be a very important theme in John chapter 11. And finally, at the end, Jesus does talk about the purpose of his mission. And I think it's a very important part of the scrutinies because you can really see that because Jesus knows what his mission is and describes it so clearly here that you can see how these three texts work together. Okay, so that's just some recommendations on kind of how to fit this into the whole picture. Now what I want to do is sort of run through the structure. What, I, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk you through the structure here and in doing that I want to be able to show you here how, um, how all, you know, the, the, the text goes along. And then um, I'll go back and point out a few things, and, and I, I think that will have to suffice for our time together on this. To start with, and, and this is an Im important uh, thing to remember, um, Jesus occurs in this text at the beginning and at the end. So Jesus is in verses 1 to 12, and then he comes back in 35 to 41. And in the intervening part is all this questioning, either of the man born blind or his parents. And you can see that when Jesus enters back in, he, he also questions the man born blind. And it's, it's, a, it's a, a kind of a, an important moment to see, you know, his re-entering the text. So, just going through the structure here, you start with, with the miracle itself. Jesus heals the man born blind. Then the neighbors question the man born blind. I, I, I love the, the way this works. Then the Pharisees question the man born blind. Then the Jews question the parents of the man born blind. And then for the second time, they question the man born blind. And then Jesus now enters into the text again. He questions the man born blind. And then finally, the Pharisees ask Jesus, are we also blind? And that, that brings us to the end of the text. Now, you, you can see that a vast majority of this text is the questioning, you know, about where this blindness comes from. Now, let's, let's, let's look at, in many ways, the miracle is the most important part. And, and you could probably spend your time uh, talking about this miracle. And, and really, I mean, that, you, the first 12 verses would almost be enough. You have two titles for Jesus here at the beginning, Rabbi, and then, of course, the, the evangelist describes him as Jesus. 
And even though this doesn't seem like a title, I, I think it, it might be the most important title here, I am the light of the world. It's not an ego a me, but it is an a me. I am the light of the world. But the key to this text is right, the, I mean, the first part here is, is this part here about th the works of God. And notice that it is necessary. Now, I mean, that, 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 that day has a marked meaning in, in certainly the synoptic gospels, and I think it, it carries over here, that must, that divine must, that part of the, the plan of God that must take place. You know, it is necessary for us to be doing, it, it, the works of God, it is necessary for us to be doing because of the one who sent me. I didn't translate that very well. Uh, let me translate that again. We must work the works of him who sent me. You know, better translation. But the works, and, and of course, when you hear that language, and you've heard, you hear it in John chapter 5 as well, we're talking here about the bringing up, the bringing in of the new creation through the atonement. And in many ways, it is the opening of the eyes. The opening up of the eyes. I mean, the works of God are to reveal who Jesus is. And, and I, I, I really, in many ways, cannot emphasize that enough. Now, if you look here, let me, I'm just getting my, if you look here at how this text then goes on here, okay, you have the actual miracle here in verse 7. Actually, I, I misspoke myself. Jesus occurs in the first seven verses. I, I, I misquoted that because he leaves here after this verse. So I apologize for that. Okay, so take that back. He, he occurs in 1 to 7. Okay, now, now here is, in a sense, a, a baptismal moment here. And, I mean, you've got the language of um, anointing here. Here, the mud. I put the mud, how often the mud occurs. It's amazing how often that occurs, you know, the, the spitting in the mud. But here's the washing, you know. And, and it's the pools of Siloam, so it's, it's like a baptismal font, you know, the, the sent ones. I mean, it's, it's really quite a remarkable moment. And I think it's important to recognize that in many ways this is sort of the climax. This is where the eyes are opened. And here's the language of washing and seeing, okay? We'll come back to that because it's such an important part of this this text, and it is part of the rhythm of this text. Okay, now, as we, as we look now at the, the neighbors questioning him, you know, he, he's a beggar. Um, I, I have, and I just did this today, I, I had, had this, this text marked up, but this is, this, is, this is the refrain, and I put it in blue. You're going to see it all the way through, you know. The, the eyes were open. Now, most of you know that, that I did a lot of work on Emmaus, and so the opening of eyes is so important. I mean, it's the climax in Luke's Gospel where their eyes are opened in the breaking of the bread. I mean, here, the eyes are opened, you know, in the, in the mud, in the anointing, and in the washing. And you can see here, again, the language of anointing, the language of eyes. Here's the mud. I mean, there's, there's this this kind of repetition of, of many of the same themes. And John, John is sort of a master at really bringing these them, themes you know, for, forward by, by repeating them. You even have a repeat here of, of the, the washing and the seeing again. You know? So you, you, you kind of rehearse the miracle here in the questioning. Now the Pharisees come in, and you know, they're the ones who are in a way, the, the, the target of all of this, they, at the very end, are really s spoken of as being the blind ones. But notice, again, I don't want to, there's the mud, and, that, and there's your refrain. The eyes are open. I put it in blue. It, it keeps coming up. I noticed that today as I was getting this text ready. The seeing, 
the eyes, the washing, the seeing, you know? Um, of course, the issue here is the Sabbath. They're trying to catch Jesus. So this is very similar to the sort of things we see when we see the disciples um, uh, being questioned in the synoptic gospels about why they do things on the Sabbath with the Lord, you know, the, especially the, the grain field that, that occurs in Luke 5. There is, again, in 17, their eyes were open. And, and, and here you can see that the title now is Prophet. And so at the end of this discussion, you know, and I also, the many signs, look at that. You know, I mean, there's such loaded language here. There's a schism among them, a division. But notice that, that with the Pharisees, the title that comes forward here is prophet. Now, I would, I would highlight that when I was preaching on this text. I would, I would see very, very, a very important theme there. Now, when the Jews come in to the picture here, it starts, and I put this in yellow. You'll see this. I, I used put faith in yellow. It begins by saying that they do not believe in him. And there's the blind and the seeing again. Um, and what's so interesting here is when you get towards the end here again, the refrain. His eyes were opened. And it's basically the same conversation. Now what's a little different here is this, this notion of fear. Now, that's not an insignificant uh, statement there, the fear, you know. The, the, the parents are afraid. And it, it is, uh, I, this, this would be, again, if you're working with the titles, this would be an interesting way of thinking of it. The fear comes from being cast out of the synagogue because they actually make the connection that the one who opens up the eyes here, that refrain again and again and again, is, in fact, the Messiah. And they're afraid. They don't want to be cast out of the synagogue, you know, and they're afraid of drawing that conclusion. And you can see that's maybe one of the reasons why there's all this questioning, because people are afraid. They don't want to, to come to the, to the conclusion that, that would cause them to lose their status. Um, I think it's so interesting they bring this guy back again to be questioned. And it, it, yeah, I don't know, is this the fourth time this refrain comes in? Okay. That would be my theme. He opens the eyes, you know. Uh, and and the, the opening of eyes, you know, is, and, and you can see this so clearly, is both obviously physical this man born blind, but there is, of course, the spiritual dimension, and they go hand in hand. I mean, as a Luke guy, eyes are huge in Luke's gospel as being both a physical and spiritual sign. So, in the questioning again, the refrain comes up. Um, and, and one of the things that, that happens here at, at, at this point is, is the, the listening, hearing, hearing. Now, that's, that's, that's important. Jesus is, is not just a miracle worker, but there is something there that goes beyond that, you know. And that language, you know, I told you already, didn't you listen? Why don't you want to hear it again, you know? And the language of disciples, you know, um, it, it is, it, who's, who is the one who speaks now the authoritative word? And you can see that the choice here is between being a disciple of Jesus and hearing him, and of course hearing him is hearing him through the blind man. Or are you, you know, and he, he, of that one, that's a title, you know, I, it's, how do you put it? But I put it in blue so you can see it. Or are you a disciple of Moses? And is, is it Moses you're going to listen to? Or are you going to listen to the one who comes to fulfill what Moses intended, you know, to be the, 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 the messianic fulfillment? There's, there's another title, this one. And, and the question is, 
from whence does he come? I put that in, in this gray, from whence, from whence. And, you know, does, does this one come from God? And I, I, this is almost climactic here, you know. If you look at verse 32, since the beginning of time, it has been heard that anyone who opened the eyes of the man born blind, you know. That's verse 32 there. What, what a remarkable statement uh, that is. And, and it's, it's a refrain, you know. Um, I, 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 again, it, it is just remarkable how that keeps popping up. Now, verse 34 does bring in um, the, the notion of sin, which sort of occurred at the beginning and now has come back. You know, is this man who is a sinner going to be teaching them anything? You know, are you a teacher? Okay, we're now to the end where Jesus comes in to question the man born blind. And you can see from the yellow here how important the language of faith is. Now, th these are the things that really kind of jump out at me. Faith is, is used four times here. And the title, Son of Man. Now, I, I have always taken that title, and, and I, I'm not sure how it works in John's Gospel because I'm not a Jehanine guy, but I'm guessing it's the same. It certainly is, is his humanity, and in the Gospels, it is always in connection with his suffering, with his passion. And it is here that they call him Lord. Now, that's Yahweh. And that is a, that is a much more profound statement than, than we might realize. And, and finally, at the very end of this questioning of Jesus, Jesus gives here, and, and I think this is rather remarkable that it happens in this particular place. And I put it in purple because it's a, it's a um, I mean, it's not necessarily a, a, a gospel moment, although the judgment of the world could be considered that. But here is the, and, and I think this is the way to put it. This is the purpose of Jesus' mission. This is, you know, this goes back to the works of God and the works that he was doing. You know, verse 39, the purpose of why he is doing the, 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 the works of the one who sent him. And 39 is, is a profound verse. For judgment I came into this world in order that those who seeing do not see, and that those who see may become blind. Now, you know who he's talking about there. You know? And, and, and this, this, this is, a, this is a, a, a huge moment of law for those who are rejecting him as the one who opens up the eyes. And he is directing that directly against the Pharisees. You know? And the Pharisees are certainly the object of that statement about the, you know. Now, when you do judgment of this world, it's Jesus who is judged. I mean, the justice comes on the cross, and the judgment of God is against Jesus for our sins, for the ones who are born blind. But, but, but look at the language. I put it all in purple here, because this is, this is very, very, I mean, it's, it's very sad, you know, in, 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 it, in the sense that it's a deeply lost section. You know, the Pharisees who were with him heard these things, and, and they say to him, you know, are we the ones, are we not blind too? Are we? Are we not blind? And then Jesus says this to them, and it's a hard saying. If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see your sins remain. Now, in a way, what you might say is that they're st still stuck with Moses, and they don't see that Jesus is the Christ, you know? And, and in that way, they are blind and they cannot see. You know, a lot, a lot, of, a lot of biblical texts end with what we would consider to be a law statement. Um, anyway, I, I have gone on too long. It's a long text, but I think there's so much here that you could kind of cull down into a, a, a very crisp, direct sermon in which you can focus on 
the, the great theme is that Jesus is the light of the world and he is the one who through his death and resurrection opens up our eyes.